I'm joined by assistant coach Dream, who's been a recent addition to the Houston Outlaws, and we're going to talk through some of the uh, performances over 2020, because unfortunately the Houston Outlaws have gone Norton 4 over the course of the two homestands that you guys have played. Um, you must have had higher expectations coming into this game, uh, or coming into this, uh, this year overall with the development, but I want to start really in the off-season rebuilding. Uh, what were some of the expectations for the Houston Outlaws coming into 2020 with such a revitalized roster? So we definitely um, knew that at the start that if we could potentially have synergy issues just because of the, the large like retooling of the roster, but we put a lot of time in, um, you know, like three block days. We started scrimming really early and the metas shifted like really rapidly in the off season. There were like three metas that never got played on stage. Um, and unfortunately, this is just the one that we didn't gel into the quickest. Um, the other metas we were like super comfortable in. And then this one we were just a little slower on. Um, but yeah, really our biggest focus was just getting everyone a lot of time in together. Um, and then also kind of doing some team activities together, just making sure everyone knew each other was friendly. That was the, the biggest focus of the, the off season kind of activity wise, um, personnel wise, we really just wanted to go after people that we thought, um, were like underrated or undervalued in the case of, you know, like Blase, Hydration, um, Repel. I think it's crazy that that they were not um, valued even higher. And then Mecco, I mean, I don't think anyone really underrates Mecco, right? He's a, a fantastic player, but he was someone that was excited to join. And obviously, we're really, really happy to have him on the team. So I think a big community question mark, and one that I had as well, was the signing of both Blase and Hydration. So I want to get some thoughts about that, because from the outside looking in, when you don't know too much about the players, it does really seem like they have almost completely overlapping hero pools. And we have seen Blase play the McCree recently, which is something that I would have not associated with either of those players beforehand. Um, so can you talk to me about some of the, maybe the differences between them and why they were picked up in the first place together? Sure. So... Um, I would I would say that hydration I think um, a lot of people are familiar familiar with I think what's interesting about both of these players is they are both actually incredibly flexible across the entire game like across multiple roles right, right, right. like Blase has um, obviously spent a lot of time on Brig uh, last year and that is not a DPS hero anymore um, he also plays tanks um, he plays Anna unfortunately we have two very good Anna players um, already on the team um, and hydration as well um, has played a lot of uh, main tank both for gladiators and for us in scrims as well. Um, so I think they both have a lot to bring to the table. Unfortunately, there's roll lock, so they can't like flex in the middle of a map um, the way that they you know could have for portions of last season. But I think they do have different strengths even within the traditional idea of like a flex DPS um, hero pool. I think hydration has some heroes that he is like absolutely transcendent on um, just very very dominant on and then blase i think has a very wide hero pool uh, amongst the the flex dps heroes and also brings a lot as far as um reading like what the enemy team's win conditions are and kind of helping lead the team when it's a, a meta where the flex dps has to kind of call things so an example would be if like Doom Reaper meta were to come back, a lot of that was very based around like Doom's cooldowns and you need to engage based around like punch cooldowns and his punch targets. So in a meta like that, we feel like that would be where Blase would have a lot of strengths because he's really good at, at communicating kind of where he wants to play, when he wants to play and kind of, you know, chatting up basically and, and forcing the whole team to do what he wants to do. Is it fair to say that Blase is a leadership figure within the team then, if he adds that much to the communication? Is he the person that's really taking the lead for the Houston Outlaws now? Um, I wouldn't say that he is like the leader on the team, but I think uh, there are times where when he, the hero he is on is the one that, that has to make a play that's required to, to pop off, right? And weirdly, McCree is... The, it, fights when he doesn't have his ult are, are like that, which is kind of an odd thing, right? Um, but definitely... Uh, when he's needed or, or when his comms will help elevate us, yes, but I don't think we rely on him to be like the sole uh, leadership figure within the team. Let's move over to Hydration as well. You, you mentioned that the guy was playing main tank in a bunch of scrims uh, prior to uh, this meta actually happening. Um, 
what was the reason to decide not to field him as the main tank? Because I, I suppose if he was training scrim time with Muma, it, there was a decision to be made there. Sure. So the times when Hydration was playing for us in uh, scrims on the main tank role, obviously last week he played uh, May for us, was not able to travel this week because of severe illness. He was actually ill on stage uh, playing last week um, and was not able to, to travel with us this week. So, um, But when he was playing with us, that was when the um, Arissa and Ryan were both played together, right? So that's a situation where we're very, very... Uh, I'm confident in his Arisa, his like game sense and his ability to like calm around the poles is is very very good and he was like very much in sync with the team but when it comes to Ryan because this is such a, a purely Ryan centric meta right now Ryan's kind of one of those heroes that you need a huge amount of hours put in on Ryan to be able to play Ryan effectively against the, the best players in the world and the bottom line is in a in a Ryan v Ryan scenario there's no one on the team that I would rather have playing Ryan than Muma right uh, Muma's as experienced as they come on uh, on main tank in in Overwatch and on Reinhardt specifically, so yeah, we we definitely want Muma in in situations like this meta. You mentioned that um, uh, hydration was too ill actually to be able to travel with you guys. Does that mean that Dante was thrown in kind of unexpectedly for this homestand? Um, Dante, I mean, we we scrimmed this week with Dante, and he we try not to like let any of our players not have any scrim time at all. We make sure everyone gets to stay fresh. We think that's really important um, for reasons like illness coming up, um, and then also because we know that um, hero pools are coming soon, and we want to make sure that everyone is just always sharp and 100% ready because we're not sure exactly what meta is going to happen on any given week, right? So we need everyone to to be ready, but definitely. Um, if if there was no issues with illness, Hydration would have played this week. Um, there have been a, a bunch of different conversations around the strategies that Houston Outlaws have employed in their games. The original conversation before the bonanza that was Houston versus Boston blew everything else out of the water was this Lucio Brigitta strategy that you guys were running. And I know that there must be rhyme and reason behind a lot of these decisions. And just because we can't figure them out doesn't mean that you guys are just randomly throwing darts against the wall. But I'm not sure what the uh, reasoning was behind that. So can you shine some light upon why you guys were coming out with the Lucio Brig to start things off? Because you have since then transitioned away from that. Sure, sure. So um, I actually think the Lucio Brig comps are, are um, really good. I think they're map situational. And our first set, there were multiple maps where the, the comp was really good. But I think the issues we were having as a team were that we were not performing with the same um, aggression and tempo on stage as we were in scrims. And that is a comp where that is not acceptable at all, right? You have low sustain, you have to move fast, you have to be very decisive, and you have to pick your fights in very good spots. So I, I think realistically, if we were playing at our best, we would still be like playing that comp situationally on the maps that it's good. But I think because we've been more focused on fixing those um, issues of differences between scrim performance and stage performance, we felt that it was better to play a comp where if we're not 100% at our scrim level, the comp will still function. Um, so that that's why we're, we're um, not running it. Basically, there's a bigger margin for error in the Ana comps. Um, but yeah, I mean, realistically, I think the Lucio Brig is really good. Um, have you heard of GOATS comp? I mean, I've heard of the original Goats comp. Yeah. What is what is the new Goats comp that you guys are talking about? Yeah, yeah. Basically, the Lucio Brig comp that we were running. Um, it it functions around like the all the same principles of the original uh, Goats comp, and I think it it works very similarly. Just for the same reason that you have to play really aggressively and, and high tempo in goats, you have to play it with the, the Lucio Brig. I think it still has a lot of value. And I think that in um, hero pools, maybe not in the initial hero pools because Lucio might not be uh, there. Um, but I think there's, there's a good potential that you'll see Lucio Brig comps throughout the year. I think they have a lot of strength. Okay, that's pretty interesting. Uh, another point that you raised just during that answer was that you feel there's been a difference between you guys playing in scrims and you guys actually being able to perform on the stage. What do you think is the reasoning behind that? Do you have any theories at the moment about what you're trying to work on to improve that? Um, so we we think it 
it's an issue of well, we think we've we've helped address the issue, and I think that that's why we saw a much better performance from us um, this week. But essentially, we had a, a very much like everyone call your own plays sort of style um, because we have a lot of veteran players and. In most metas, it makes sense to let players call to set up their own ultimates, right? Um, like, hey, I have this ult. I want to use this ult. Um, but we were having an issue where people were kind of, instead of, you know, taking the initiative on stage, they were kind of deferring. Like, oh, do you want to use your ult? Or, like, do we want to make this play? And instead of just being very confident and going right away. So instead, we kind of set up a more rigid structure for this week on in what situations, who is, is making those calls. Um, and that made it much easier where the players didn't feel like, you know, sometimes... Uh, you know, I don't. I want to make this call, but I feel like other people might want to call, so I don't want to overcom them. Um, I think players were worried about overcoming on stage, so they we all ended up kind of undercoming a bit. Um, but it, it's not really like a nerves issue or anything like that. We have a lot of veterans on the team. No one's really nervous um, up on stage. It's just about kind of giving them uh, more structure, basically. And I, I I think it worked. I think we improved a lot this week. Kind of got a little unlucky, to be, to be honest. So. Um. Uh a, a, a classic kind of reasoning or excuse that's given to teams that have a new addition of a bunch of Korean players that people don't know that well is that uh, communication issues, language barriers, this kind of stuff. Uh, to what degree do you think that holds true for the Houston Outlaws? Have you had difficulties with language barriers integrating Rappel, Jexa, Mecco, this kind of stuff? Is communication issues a fair label for the Houston Outlaws? Oh, n not at all, not at all. I would say that... Uh, Mecco and Jexy especially have excellent English. Um, maybe not if they wanted to just, I don't know, speak English in a, in a normal conversation with someone that, that has a crazy accent or something. But um, definitely when it comes to Overwatch English, right? Ec no issues. No issues whatsoever. Repel, the, we definitely... Um, like, he doesn't have any actual issues in-game just during review. Sometimes when we're talking about, like, kind of abstract concepts and stuff, we have to kind of reword some things sometimes. Like, we'll say something, and he's like, do you mean it like this or, or like this? And we kind of just clarify one way or the other. But really, we are not having communication issues um, at all, I would say. So that's definitely not an excuse that we will use whatsoever. Our, our communication is definitely not the, not the problem. So that brings me on with the topic of Rappel to the pro possibly the most bewildering question that we have all had when watching the games, the substitution of Rappel for Raucus. Um, what is the reasoning behind this? Uh, is it the mystical coin flip in the back? Are you just trying to split game time because you think they're both good? What's, what's the reasoning behind this? Well, certainly we, we definitely think they're both good, right? And they're both good at Anna, but we are not... Um Definitely not not a coin flip though. That would be great. Um, and uh, it's we definitely don't have any idea that just because um, both players are good that they have to split time, right? Um, especially with hero pools being a thing this season, there are going to be good players that are just like not going to play for a week because the meta is just super weird for a week. You know what I mean? So that that that's that's not our issue at all. What? Our thoughts on the two is that they are both very good at Ana, and they both have really um, different strengths on the hero. So I think the play style of how this meta works is very map dependent. So there are some maps where um, you are encouraged both on attack and defense to play very fast and to play um, very aggressively. And then there are some maps where there's a lot more opportunity to look for flanks and the enemy team will also be constantly looking for flanks, right? Um, and we think that Raucus is better on maps that work some ways, and then we have Repel uh, plays better on maps that work other ways, right? So the maps that they play on stage are the maps that they practice in scrims. We're not um, adjusting that on stage. Actually, I think that's a, a candidly a mistake that we made for Game 7 yesterday was putting Repel in for Li Zhang because that is the map that he practices. Raucus doesn't uh, scrim on that map very often because we do feel that Repel's strengths um, show more on Li Zhang. But just because of momentum and the series being so long, I think we, we should have left Raucus in, even though that wasn't the map that he usually scrims. That's one of our, our Repel maps. So that's definitely um, an improvement we we can make as a, as a staff that we've identified when it comes to those substitutions between Raucus and Repel. Yeah, that's really interesting because it just takes me straight into this 
outrageous game that we saw yesterday. Uh, me and Bren were casting it as well. We started out thinking that it would be fairly close, and so did the rest of the community, honestly. Maybe not for the best reasons as far as you're concerned, but it, but it did seem to be a battle of two teams that were struggling to be able to get wins. Both teams, both franchises, I should say, on long loss streaks. Neither had a really great ends to the previous season, but they'd retooled and had poor beginnings to 2020 as well. When you're coming into a series like that, and it looks to be the most winnable match that you've got at the beginning of 2020, uh, do, do you approach it in any different way? Um, I mean, I don't think we had a, a different approach at all. Um, yeah, I don't think really that, that was an issue. To, I mean, we, we really wanted to win. Um, it was Blase's ex-team on his birthday, so everyone wanted to, to get the win for him, right? We, we wanted to, to be able to um, do that for him. We felt that that would be something that he, he appreciated. But other than that, uh, it's not. we didn't really view it differently than any other matches. I'm, I'm going to be honest, I don't – I mean, obviously uh, Boston has had struggles as well, but – We've felt like every match that we've played so far has been winnable. Not that Boston is is you know more within reach than others. I thought we could have won today against NYXL. I think that we made a couple very small mistakes that uh, cost us maps. But I, I mean, yeah, realistically, I I think we could have won today pretty easily. Well, let's let's kind of run through the Boston game because it seemed like. At the beginning, you guys didn't really have a, that much of a foot in the door. The first map was relatively close, but you didn't get a round. And then there was a couple of draws on Temple of Anubis and then on Blizzard World as well. Um, in the middle of those, there was a huge push from Boston where they, they slammed home Dorado with three minutes as well. So as a coach in the dugout, looking at the progress of this game and your team just hanging on, what's running through your head? Um, so definitely... I feel like the first two maps were um, very, very close, very unfortunate, right? Um, I think Ilios, we easily could have uh, won both of those rounds. Um, just some very small mistakes. And then Anubis, we should have won, just period, point blank, right? Um, our second attack, we had more than enough time to get a single tick on first, and we just made mistakes. Um, we didn't, again, just play the way we, we did in scrims or even the way we did on our first attack right so but it, it's it's really easy um when we have like veteran players and when we've been performing the way that we uh, have in in scrims to look at everyone and say hey guys like we were so close to to having anubis realistically we we could have won ilios as well this could be you know two one the other way right now if we just you know pick it up play high tempo play aggressive play the way that we you know play when we're practicing this is like super winnable it's, it's very easy to come back in this match which is we did come back we weren't able to to close it at the end unfortunately but um it was very much just like hey guys like we've been talking about you know uh playing like we practice let's just step up and do that right now we we know that we can do that you know let's go out there with with high energy and and take it to them and we were able to do that what was the tempo shift that happened halfway through? Is that something that came from the coaches? Is that something that came from the players? Is it just because you're on control? Uh, what was the, what instigated that shift in momentum during the series where it seemed like you were just hanging in and then me and Bren just felt like the reverse sweep was inevitable? Once we'd seen the first control map, it was so dominant, the complete opposite way. So I, I think it was really just everyone saying like we are just sick of how it feels to play uh, too slow and not play in a in a decisive way. And we had multiple people step up and just start calling plays constantly and being very proactive um, and hyping everyone up. And then once that started, it just started a cycle and everyone was feeding on each other. Everyone started um, calming aggressively, playing confidently, uh, you know, saying disrespectful things about the other team and comps right it was it was like we got momentum we got our feet under us and we finally felt like we were the team that we kind of knew we we are right um i don't think it was a, a single player i don't think it was um anything specific that we said it was coach as coaches it's just what we've been talking about for the last two weeks kind of as a team what we've been working on as a team finally just kind of clicking and coming together 
And then unfortunately in that map seven, you guys after after staying in it for so long and then clawing it back to being level, unfortunately the final map doesn't go your way. I spoke yesterday to a bunch of the Boston people and Muffin was just elated, Color Hex was totally drained, but looking at the other side, I mean that must have been an absolutely brutal loss for the players after feeling like you were so close to, to winning it. Um, I mean... If you're going to lose, that's the way to lose, man. That's what I'll say. Uh, taking it to, to map seven in a first to three is, I mean, <laughs> it's long, but that's 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 about as like, you know, we we easily could have won that. Right. And and, you know, it, it, it sucks to feel like, oh, we could have won that, but we didn't. But we would definitely rather feel that way than like, oh, we just got smashed like we had, you know, we, we just underperformed really hard. So um, I think obviously at first just with how much emotion there was in in the comeback losing and having that kind of deflate a little bit was was rough but um we had our meeting after to talk about what we wanted to um focus on for the the match today and then we also had our our meeting you know pre uh warm up today and everyone i mean it, last night a couple hours after the match everyone was at the meeting we were um, excited. We were glad that we had kind of shaken off some of those issues that we had last week, um, and we were we were ready to go. So I think it, it it definitely was a little deflating at first, but we bounced back pretty quick, uh, and we're we're ready to play today. Just a quick note on the Houston New York game that we've uh, just seen as well. Uh, a rough loss. New York seemed like they're in control for the majority of the match, so you had your moments. Was Mecco excited to face his former team? Absolutely. Um, we actually ran into them just in front of the venue. We were both arriving at the same time. So um, kind of talking a little bit, throwing jabs back and forth. So uh, but no, th that's another situation like the Blase situation where it's a it's a prior team. So we really want to um, get the win. That's something that obviously players think about. Right. You know, this is my old team. I'm not with them anymore. Um, I know them. They know me. But I you know, we really want to win this one. So um, unfortunately, we weren't able to to pull it out. Uh, but Again, it's at the end of the day, it's just another game, and we're uh, prepped and excited for our homestand next week. You have your homestand next week. You're on a Northern Four start to the 2020 season, and I believe you're now on a nine-match loss streak as well as a franchise, which uh, can't feel good for the players, particularly people like Muma, who've been with the team previously from 2019. How do you pick you guys up coming into the homestand? What kind of stuff are you going to be working on to erase improve what's the prep going to look like moving into houston so the biggest thing is we're we're not going to be uh ill anymore and we're not going to have to fly in planes while having the flu which is not great and is also a good way to give other people the flu um so that's definitely something where it's like hey guys we're going to be able to show up this week and nobody's going to be sick no one's going to like everyone's going to feel like they can play at 100 percent um we had people this weekend that like we're having a hard time talking, um, like losing their voice, uh, obviously having a hard time like sleeping when you have the flu, like it just affects like so much stuff. Right. And I'm not trying to make excuses at all, but I'm just trying to say that we're, we're very excited next week that that's not something we're going to have to deal with again. Um, and we are really excited to just play in front of our fans. We think we have a, one of the most passionate and, and big fan bases in the Overwatch League, despite our recent struggles. Um, but we're, we're really excited to, to uh, play in, in front of our fans, and we think that it's going to be a, a big week for us. Uh, just one final question, because I missed it out when we were talking about it previously. There have been a lot of conversations online about Blase and the McCree role for that, uh, for that guy. Uh, it's not really a natural hero that I would have associated with Blase. I haven't seen him on Hitscanner McCree before. We were talking a bit about his hero pool, and you said it was very large, but it doesn't seem like... Um, at least from the eye test and from a, a few statistics as well, that he's really been, a, been able to measure up with a bunch of the other McCrees in the league. Um, what was the thought process about putting him on that role rather than like Dante or Linksa, these kind of players that have played hit scan kind of stuff in the past? And uh, how confident are you in his ability to perform on that role? Sure. So um, I'll say that uh, statistically, a lot of our team is uh, underperforming just because we've been losing matches, yeah. right? Um, so that kind of makes that part of the conversation hard to have, right? Um, I think that obviously, like I've said before, our performance in uh, scrims has not reflected the same way on stage. We're very happy with how Blase plays in scrims. We're very happy with him um, on the hitscan role. I think he 
has lots of experience um, on like hit scan and tracking style heroes with which McCree be, with the fast fire rate you definitely have to at least like semi track with it you can't just like hard flick right um, so th yeah that's something we're really confident in I think especially come hero pools people are going to be really impressed because you we are going to have to flex a lot and Blase is a DPS that can flex to both roles like very confidently um, so I, I think that's a, a strength for him, I think that McCree is not necessarily a hero that Dante specifically has a lot of uh, time or experience on also when, you know, comparing to, to Blase. And then obviously uh, a lot of people want us to, to have Linkser on that pure hit skin role, which is totally understandable. Um, but performance wise, we are confident in Blase. We know what Blase is like when the whole team is functioning correctly. Um, and obviously when we're out of sync and we're playing slow, it makes those McCree flanks like much less effective makes it much easier for the enemy team to shut down those those flanks and things like that. But Blase's instincts on when he should flank and what his flank should be, as well as when the enemy McCree is going to flank and uh, the timing of that and being able to kind of control that really well helps us a, a very large amount. We are um, happy with Blase. We are confident in Blase. We think that as the team kind of continues to, to get it in gear, you'll kind of see... Uh, a rising sea lift all ships. You know what I mean. So we think we think that you'll you'll see that with Blase. Okay. Well, good luck for the Houston homestand. I wish you all the success in the world as well, and uh, we'll see how it goes. I'm excited to watch the Houston crowd because the Texan crowds, just in general, are kind of crazy.